Hi, welcome back. We are in the second segment of Lecture 11 on moderation analyses. In the first segment, I gave you a simple example, and I actually glossed over a lot of details. So what I'd like to do in this second segment is get a little technical and show you sort of the nitty-gritty uh, nuts and bolts that go into a moderation analysis. Then in the third segment, we'll do sort of a full-blown analysis, uh, adding in these details. And then in the next lecture, we'll do that as well in R. Uh, so we'll see this sort of repeatedly in the next couple segments. So the two technical details we need to cover in the context of moderation analyses are one, centering, and two, dummy coding. And you've probably heard about these if you have some exposure to statistics or multiple regression. So centering is real easy. Uh, it simply means to put our predictors, our x variables, in deviation form. So for every variable, just take the individual score and subtract the mean. What that does for us is it gives us, uh, for every predictor variable, the mean will be zero. That's convenient if you think about how to interpret regression coefficients, right? Because the regression constant is the predicted score on y when all the x's are zero. So now, if we center, then that regression constant is going to become really meaningful and easy to interpret. So that's one of the reasons, I'm already sort of jumping ahead, is why do we want to do this? One of the reasons is conceptual, which I was hinting at just there. Uh, and the other is just sort of a purely mathematical statistical reason, which I'll get to after the conceptual part. So it's just conceptually, I think you, you may have already seen this. Um, let's suppose that Y is uh, a, a child's language development. So we have some, some measure or, or set of measures uh, to assess sort of longitudinally how uh, a child is progressing uh, linguistically. And say we might predict that from the mother's vocabulary, and we could also predict it from the child's age. So we should expect positive correlations all around here, right? Um, but again, the intercept, the regression constant, b sub 0, is the predicted score on y when all the x's are 0. That's really silly in this example, right? And it's silly in a lot of examples. So we would be predicting the child's language development when the mother scores zero on the vocabulary test, whatever it is, um, and when the kid is zero. Um, that's just a meaning, meaningless task, right? Um, so that's the second line. So if, if x is zero um, or meaningless or impossible, then the regression constant is really difficult to interpret. In fact, you don't even want to interpret um, and, and a lot of times we do that. We just skip right over the regression constant and just go to the other regression coefficients. But if we center everything, then the regression constant is really handy, and particularly in moderation analyses. So if x equals 0 is the average on all our predictors, then in this example, um, the predicted score on y when all x's are 0 is just the child's language development for a mom with an average vocabulary and a kid who's at an average age in the sample. So that's more meaningful, that's interesting. There's another step to this though with respect to moderation analysis. So everything I just said is true of a simple regression. Um, remember how to interpret regression coefficients in multiple regression. The regression coefficient b1 is the slope relating x to y, x1 to y, um, assuming just an average score on x2. If there's no moderator variables hanging around, then you can assume that that slope relating uh, x1 to y is consistent across all values of x2, or consistent across the entire distribution of x2. But if there is a moderation, then what that implies is the relationship between 
x1 and y changes as a function of x2, right? That's the whole point of moderation, is you're introducing a second variable that has influence over the relationship between x1 and y. So if that's the case, then look at the second line here. Where in the distribution of x2 is b1 most representative? If it's not consistent across the distribution of x2, then where should we place it? Well, the best place would be in the middle of the distribution of x2, right? If we center, then that's exactly what happens. So it's really convenient in moderation analysis. And this is best illustrated by looking at some graphs. So I'm going to show you four graphs. They all look like this. Here is an example of an uncentered and purely additive regression model. So what I mean by purely additive is there's no moderation. So you can see in this regression equation, there's just two predictors. There's not that third product term. And it's uncentered. So the intercept is 2. Again, that's the predicted score on y when both x's are 0. Well, if you look at this graphically, hopefully this will start to make some sense. So where in the graph uh, is x1, 0, and x2, 0? Well, here's x1, here's x2. All the way down in the lower right of this, is 0 on both. So if we go to that point on the graph and sort of go across to y, you'll get a predicted y score of 2. So it's really low down there. Then the slope of the x1 function is just 0 0.2. So that's this line here. You can see it's really shallow. Uh, the slope of the x2 function is a little steeper. That's 0.6. Okay? What happens when we center the variables x1 and x2? Well, nothing <laughs> to the graph, uh, except if you look carefully, just the scales, have sh the, the, the scales have shifted, right? So now down the, the lower right, it's not 0, 0, it's negative 5. Uh, so if you look up at the regression equation, the slopes are exactly the same, right? 0 0.2 and 0 0.6. Slopes are the slopes. All I've done is change the scales. But what that does is it, change, it changes the regression constant, right? So where now is 0, 0 in this graph? Well, here is 0 on x1, and here is 0 on x2. So it's like somewhere in there, <laughs> somewhere in there. Um, and then again, go over to y, and what you'd get is a predicted score of 6. So all we've done there is change the regression constant. Predicted score when both x's are 0. Let's look at it in a case with moderation. So here's an uncentered regression model, but now we have moderation. There's an interaction, you could say, between x1 and x2, meaning the slope of x relating x1 to y changes over the distribution of x2. Likewise, it's, actually you can see this even better, I think, that the x2 function, you know, look at these sort of steps on the staircase. The, the slope relating x2 to y changes, it gets steeper as x1 increases. Right? That's moderation or interaction. X1 and X2, their effects on Y are not just additive, they're over additive. They're interacting. And we can see that graphically really nicely. This is a clear example of moderation. Let's look at the regression coefficients. So again, our Regression constant is just predicted score on y when all x's are 0. So that, again, in the uncentered graph is way down here in the lower right. So we're down here. Go over. Again, it's 2. Uh, again, I just have a slope of 0.2 and 0.6 for x1 and x2, respectively. But then I also have this moderation uh, coefficient. Here's where centering really helps. 
let's center that same model, same exact data. Okay. Now notice what changes. Now the slopes for the main effects, remember I'll call those the main effects, x1, x2, now those slopes changed. Because they're the slopes when the other variable is zero. So if we look back at this one, the slope was 0.2 for x1. That was like in the uh, additive case. And it was 0.6 for x2. But look at the range of slopes. That's not really a good representative of the slope for x1 across the range of x2 or vice versa, right? If we center, we get a more representative slope. Because now, it's in the middle of this graph. See, remember, 0 is now here and 0 is now here. So this step right here, that is the slope for x2, uh, slope for x2 predicting y at an average level of x1 because we've centered. And that's more representative of the entire distribution of x2 than picking this little slope down here, right? And that happened because we centered x1 and x2. Notice the regression constant changes as well, not surprising. What doesn't change is the regression coefficient for the moderation term. That's going to be the same regardless of whether we center or not. But it makes the interpretation of the first order or main effects easier to interpret. And again, a way to think about this, um, this is sort of complicated, a complicated analysis. Um, I actually don't cover this sometimes in my, in my undergraduate course because we just don't get to it. Um, a lot of these slides I take from my, my graduate level course. Um, go back to the simpler case where there was no moderation. Remember what centering really did was it just gave us a more meaningful regression constant, right? Remember the mother's uh, or the, the child's linguistic development example. All it did was it gave us a regression constant that was meaningful, easier to interpret, had some sort of conceptual uh, value to it, right? It wasn't just a number. The same thing can be said in moderation here. Now what we're doing is if we have a moderation term, the product, it's making the predictors that are sort of one step lower, if you think of them hierarchically, it makes these more meaningful. Just like in the additive case, centering made this more meaningful. And that would be true if we added in more uh, product terms. So we could do you know, the product of three predictors. Right? That would be a three-way interaction or three-way three moderation. Um, we'll stop at two. OK, those are the conceptual reasons. In a nutshell, it just helps to uh, provide us with re regression coefficients that are easier to interpret, that are more meaningful. Um, there's also just sort of a mathematical statistical reason. Um, remember, the product term is literally the product of x1 and x2. And if we don't center x1 and x2, then sometimes the product can become very correlated with one or both of the predictors. And if you have two predictors in a, in a multiple regression model, that are really highly correlated, that leads to a problem called multicollinearity, which is a bad thing. Uh, you don't want to see that in your output. Um, and I, I'm going to spare you the details of multicollinearity for now, uh, but if you think back to the first lecture on multiple regression, remember that each individual regression coefficient only captures the unique variance associated with that predictor. So imagine if you have two predictors in a regression equation that are really highly correlated. They're going to be explaining the same variance in y. 
uh, to the point where y you might not be able to estimate regression coefficients for one of the predictors because they're just too highly correlated. That's the problem of multicollinearity. But if we center, we don't have to worry about that. Okay, so just an interim summary for this segment is if we center our predictors, then we could run a moderation analysis sort of in a more appropriate fashion than I did in the first segment. As I said, in the first segment, I gave you a really easy example where we didn't have to deal with this. So if we want to do this sort of the, the right way, we center our predictors. In the first step, we could, we could look at the main effects. In the second step, we could look at the moderation effect. And there's two ways to assess whether the moderation is significant. One is just look at the regression coefficient for the product term. Is that significant? But if you do it sequentially like this, remember a, a sequential regression? Um, if you do it sequentially like this, then you have two models, model one, model two, and then you can do that model comparison that we did when we did sequential regression. And you can do uh, an F test on the percentage of variance explained by model one versus model two. Uh, so there's a couple ways to evaluate uh, the, mo the moderation effect if you do it sequentially. Okay, second tedious part, bear with me, it's a long segment um, of sort of technical details, um, but it'll pay off in the next lecture where we get to play in R and, and, now, and we'll have all this done. Um, so last piece of this is, and again, you may have seen this before, um, is just dummy coding. So we didn't have to deal with this in the, the simple example I showed you in the first segment because there were just two levels of the categorical predictor, SES. I just said high, low. What if you have a categorical predictor that has lots of levels? Then you need to come up with some coding scheme to throw into the regression equation. So for this, uh, to demonstrate this, I'm going to use uh, an example relating to that faculty salary example that we've used. Uh, but just slightly different. So what I'm, the example I'm going to uh, use here is, imagine we're looking at a group of professors, and before we were looking at psychology professors, history professors, and sociology professors. Now let's just zoom in on the psychology professors. Um, that's, I'm in the psychology department. Um, and then we could look within the psychology department, there's sort of different areas of concentration or areas of research. So some are cognitive psychologists, some are social psychologists, some do what's called behavioral neuroscience, uh, and some are sort of on the fence of cognitive and neuroscience, and they say they're cognitive neuroscience. Um, so let's say we just look at, we, we just categorize professors as one of those four, as, in, as being as in one of those four areas, and then we just look at how many publications does each professor have in each area. So we can ask the question, well, do cognitive psychology professors publish more than social psychology professors? Not the kind of question you want to ask at a faculty meeting. Um, but we could do it, right? Um, and there are actually differences. Uh, so neuroscience actually tends to publish more because they publish sort of shorter uh, empirical pieces more uh, than especially social. Um, but I won't bore you with those details. I'm using this as an example just to demonstrate how we can do dummy coding. So the question we would, be a, we would be asking here is, is there a significant difference in the number of publications across area within the psychology department? Now, if you know a little bit about statistics already, um, we haven't covered this topic yet, but you might be thinking, well, that's a one-way ANOVA. And you're right, it is a one-way ANOVA because you have a categorical predictor and a continuous outcome. That's what we're going to do, but we're going to just code it differently and run it as a multiple regression. Mathematically, it's the same thing, but it just looks a little different. So the way dummy coding works is you have to pick one of your categories as the reference category. And since I'm in the cognitive group, I picked cognitive. It's very egocentric. My group's the <laughs> reference group. Uh, so the reference group is one that gets zeros for all the codes. So there's code one, code two, code three, and then the others just get a one for one of the codes. 
So in your data file, or in your data frame in R, what your data might have looked like before adding the dummy codes is, is just up to this point, right? So you just have your case, like a, an ID number, what group they're in, and then how many publications they have. These people are publishing a lot. Um, these, are, these are full professors. Um, if any of you are sort of young scholars out there, don't be threatened. Uh, let's assume they're full professors. Um, but then we would have to add these three columns in our data frame. And again, if you're in cognitive, you just get 0, 0, 0. If you're in social, you get 1, 0, 0, and so on. What we then do is run a regression analysis with C1, C2, and C3 as the predictors. We do that because we can't just do like the LM function in R. LM won't accept group as a variable in that function because it's not quantitative. It's, it's a string variable. So R would give you an error message. So we need to come up with this coding scheme. So here it is. We have C1, C2, and C3. Now think again about what the regression coefficients mean, and you, sh you should start to see why this makes some sense. So what's the regression constant again? It's the predicted score on Y when all the X's are zero. So it's the predicted number of publications for a cognitive psychology professor, because they're the reference group, right? And what's the beta or the slope for C1? It's the predicted change in Y with a one unit increase in X. Well, a one unit increase in X gets us from cognitive to social for C1. So it's going to show us the difference between cognitive and social. Um, I'm giving away the punchline here. Let me go ahead. Uh, so here's a summary. Um, this is not our output. I've summarized both unstandardized and standardized in one table. So you could see, and the, and the T values and P values, so you could see everything. Uh, but again, look at the regression constant. Uh, what we see is 93.3. Well, where did that number come from? Let me show you the descriptive statistics. So here are the number of publications by area. If you look at cognitive, the mean is 93.3. So go back, bam, 93.3. Right? Predicted score on Y when all the X's are zero. We coded cognitive, zero, zero, zero. So it's going to give us back the mean. Why is social negative 32? Well, let's look at the descriptives. Social is, on average, about 32 publications less. That's why it's negative 32. With a one unit change in C1, we went from cognitive to social, we went down 32. Okay, so this is a nifty way of coding categorical variables because what these values tell us is the difference between the reference group and each other category. If you wanted to know the difference between, say, social and neuro, you'd have to rerun it and change the reference group. And that's why if we only had a categorical predictor, we would just run this as an ANOVA, and we'll do that later in the course. But it also gives us these pairwise comparisons, so that's sort of nifty as well. So it tells us which of these comparisons is statistically significant and which aren't, and so on. Um, or if you prefer sort of an estimate of effect size, you, just, you could glance at the standardized regression coefficients. Um, but anyway, it's a convenient way to, cate to, uh, to code a categorical predictor in a multiple regression. If you noticed, the, if you did the math like, out to three significant digits, and I, I bet you there are lots of you out there who did that, um, you might be saying, hey, they don't, those didn't add up. And they didn't add up perfectly. And that's because there were a different number of professors in each area. So what happens is they, they got weighted sort of differently. To demonstrate that, you could do a different sort of coding scheme, what I'm calling unweighted effects coding. So say I don't want my regression constant to be the predicted score for the cognitive group. Say I want it to be the predicted score for everybody. 
Well, that, what I can do is pick one group again, say cognitive, give it negative ones, and then just use the same coding scheme as before. What this does is it weights sort of half of our distribution uh, negatively, half positively. Um, then if I look at the regression coefficients, all I really want you to look at is here. Um, it gives me a regression coefficient of 81.9. That's the predicted score on Y now just for everybody. That's the average. But again, if you're really careful about your math and you're sitting there watching this lecture with your calculator out, um, you see that it's not exactly 81.9, it's 81.69. Why didn't it match up perfectly? Because, as I said, there's different numbers of professors in the different areas. So if we want it to be perfect, if you want to get those decimal places just right, I have a lot of grad graduate students who are like that, they need to get it exact. Um, then what you can do is weighted effects coding. Instead of just putting in negative ones, you weight the coefficients by the number of people in the reference category, cognitive, relative to the category that takes on a one for that code. So here we would put in the N for social over the N for cognitive. If we put those values in instead of just one, um, then we'd get exactly 81.9 for the regression coefficient. The point of the unweighted and weighted effects coding is just to show you that there are many ways of coding a categorical predictor in a regression analysis. All we need for moderation analyses is the initial dummy coding scheme. That works great. I just wanted to show you that there are other ways. So in the next segment, in the next lecture, when we do moderation analyses, we're just going to code categorical predictors using that simple dummy coding scheme. And that's what we'll do in the next segment.